Good evening. We're going to divide this into two parts of who he is and what he does. So the first part is going to be divided across the top like that. And we're going to start with ways that he's described, revealed, whatever, shown up in scripture. And there are at least seven metaphors, ways that he is introduced to us uh, by means of talking about other things that we know so we understand who he is. We don't know. So the questions we want to ask along the way is, what is the metaphor? Because sometimes we just miss that. What's the meaning of it? Particularly, how is the metaphor used in the biblical framework? Get those ideas straight. And then ask the question, what does it mean uh, for relationship to us? So we're not going to go in quite as much detail as we could, but I just want to bring that up so that when you're just reading through the Bible and you come across these metaphors, you pause and you think, oh, okay, I know what it is. I know it refers to the Holy Spirit. What is it telling me about the Holy Spirit? And that can be fruitful for you. I think it's supposed to draw us into meditation uh, by not just declaring things directly. So the first one, probably the one we most think of, is the dove, uh, which isn't in Genesis 1-2, but it does show up in John 1, uh, the uh, Jordan baptism. It's the only place where the dove actually shows up as a metaphor for the Spirit is the Jordan baptism in all four Gospels. But in Genesis 1, uh, verse 2, the Spirit is hovering over the waters, which is more this kind of hovering. It's a birdie kind of thing where the Spirit is present with creation, sort of bringing life to bear upon it. And in Genesis 8, uh, not mention of the Holy Spirit, but a dove is used, sent out from the ark, and it indicates that uh, peace with God is now real again. And so doves are a sign of peace and that kind of thing. So maybe that's some of the background for why uh, the Holy Spirit chose to be imaged as a dove uh, showing up at Jesus' baptism. Uh, it could have been other things, I suppose. It's not that it actually was a dove, but uh, like a dove, which is indicating, you know, above to below, heavenly, maybe if, if it was a white dove, it was purity, uh, but it at least indicates some kind of presence of God with us, and especially marking out the Messiah. The, it, in all of these, there is um, the bird over water, and it's creation, new creation, you know, new start after judgment, so there, there are some pattern things going on there. Uh, and j definitely in Jesus' ministry, it is a new start. It's a new creation week. It's a new, it's a remaking of things. Anyway, wind is probably the most common. It shows up in all of the references to the Holy Spirit by the word spirit, whether it's the Old Testament term ruach, which is about 378 times. 300 of those are not referring to the Holy Spirit, but 78 of them are. So there's something about wind or breath or the principle of life, because it's the terms used in all these ways, there's something about that that is to tell us something about who the Holy Spirit is and, and what he is, what he does. Uh, same thing in the New Testament, except we have a lot more references to the Holy Spirit, 261. The reason is probably because the New Testament is the age of the Spirit, from Jesus' ministry until the present. And so his activity can have a lot more uh, clarity and intensity in our lives. But just if we think about wind and breath, he is the life giver. He enlivens us. Uh, wind is invisible, like he is invisible, right, and spiritual. Wind is very powerful. Wind is potentially, you know, omnipresent. That fits a lot of things about him. So that, that can uh, be in our minds as we're thinking about uh, who he is according to the idea of wind. And that would be in place any time that uh, he is specifically referenced. In Acts 2, it's at Pentecost, and there's no reference to the Holy Spirit as like wind, but the house is filled with the sound of a mighty rushing wind, right? And then they were all filled with the Spirit. So wind fills things. It fills sails. It fills your lungs. Uh, it carries things along. And these are all things like what the Holy Spirit does. So when you have reference to people being filled with the Spirit, there is a kind of windy metaphor behind that. And the idea that you need air to live Right? And he is, he is the, the sustainer of everything that's alive. So that's valuable, I think. Oil. Uh, they would have been thinking olive oil, and particularly for use in light, uh, especially in the, the uh, menorah and the temple. And so light in the ancient world uh, would have been connected with olive oil. And 
uh, is also used in sacrificial stuff, temple consecration ideas. The, the priests are anointed with oil, kings are anointed with oil, prophets, lepers are anointed with oil. So the ideas of uh, cleansing and healing and light bringing. So he is the spirit of prophecy. He is the spirit of healing. He is the spirit empowering people to carry out various tasks, whether as king as, or as messiah. And so anytime you have somebody being anointed with oil, even if oil's not mentioned, that's the only thing they anoint with, I think that's a, a tangible, visible symbol of the presence and action of the Holy Spirit. And so when you, when you move forward to Jesus, he is the messiah. He is the one anointed with the spirit, right? He is the man of the Spirit. And so anytime the word Christ is mentioned, or the, the Messiah, Old Testament Christ, I think we should be looking for an implication to the Holy Spirit, and that's going to be more prominent when we get to the Gospels. So the ideas of revelation and presence, and uh, you know, the flame is supposed to be in the temple constantly. Fire shows up in lots of ways, uh, manifesting God's presence to Moses, and uh, the flames over each person at Pentecost, little tongue of flame kind of thing. So fire is used for judgment and purification. It's used to offer sacrifices to God. And uh, it's a sign of divine presence and guidance. You think of the, the pillar of flame that's you know, leading them out of the wilderness uh, from Egypt. So that we can say, so what does this tell us about the Holy Spirit? Not that every reference to fire is a reference to the Holy Spirit, but when he is identified with fire, we can see what's the range of meaning. And so he is for us uh, divine guidance, uh, divine presence. He purifies us. He makes us holy. And he manifests God's judgment uh, in the world. I think that the, the nearness of what these metaphors say about the, the Holy Spirit's presence and action uh, should help us build to this theme that when God acts in the world, it is the spirit that is the one doing it. So you have in creation, God speaks, you know, God made the heavens and the earth, right? But it's the spirit who is the one who is actually on the scene. God indwells us, but it's the spirit who is the one most often specified as the one indwelling us. So fire is pretty good as long as you're on the right side and not getting judged and being <laughs> guided. Water is uh, probably one of my favorite. Uh, water is used in a bunch of ways in the Old Testament, of course, and uh, Ezekiel 36 is the New Covenant passage saying, I will sprinkle you with clean water and you'll be clean. So water is uh, purification, washing, cleansing. Uh, Isaiah 44, he says, I will pour out my spirit. Right? So the, when, whenever pour and uh, filling, filling could be water or wind, I guess. Uh, these are implying the Holy Spirit. Jesus makes it most clear in John 7. He says, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And, and uh, then John says, this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those were to receive from him when he was lifted up, or when he was glorified, right? so after the ascension. Anyway, water is uh, important because you need it for life, and you need the Holy Spirit to be alive. And he makes us newly alive, spiritually. And uh, he raises us from the dead. And so water is also uh, purification, cleansing us, washing us, and... Uh, water is, is, is a pretty good thing, like wind or air, for the idea of omnipresence and unlimited. Also, water can be very powerful. It can satisfy your thirst, and it can also wash you away in a big flood, right, which would be judgment. So, uh, he's a seal, right? So, in the ancient world, is not a <laughs> fish-eating aquatic animal. Seals were wax or clay, and they were used... Uh, the example in Je Jeremiah 32 is something you'd use to conclude a contract. So the Holy Spirit is used just a couple times, or referred to this way by Paul, to talk about um, us being marked as God's possessions. That the, the Holy Spirit present in your life is the sign of God's having laid claim to you. That he has signed his name to you. And, and it's not just marking you, but it's saying, I have laid hold of you. And this is kind of like the UPS tracking label. You know, it's, it's guaranteed delivery to, uh, to the end of salvation, okay? So it's his ownership and the, the protection and sure delivery to salvation. That's given in uh, Ephesians and 2 Corinthians uh, along with the idea of a pledge, where a pledge is a, a down payment, a guarantee. So the spirit is a pledge 
that we have now, that the rest that God has promised to us is going to come. So what we're waiting for is a world without evil and a resurrection from the dead and no more sin for us or anybody else. And, and that we're, we can be sure of that. We can be so sure that we give this life away and uh, live by the hope because we have been guaranteed what God has promised to us. So those are the metaphors and I just uh, commend them to you to look for them and to see how much they emphasize his nearness to us and his presence and action in the world. There are also four words, I don't know what else to call them, but they're just words, that uh, he's, he's called the Holy Spirit. So we have to back up and think, what does holy mean in the Bible? Usually we think of it as uh, purity, right? Moral purity, free from sin kind of thing. But uh, holy, if that little star field is the whole universe, he, he, holy is other than. It's the idea of transcendence, it's different from, it's uniqueness. When God is holy, it's, it, he is the only God, he is unique. So I think we should recognize at least that the Holy Spirit is pure from sin, but also that he's not mother nature. He's not the spirit of this world. He's not the life force. He, he, is, he is judge of creation. He is creator of creation. And uh, he is different from us in many, many ways, at least with our sin. And one of the things when he engages us is that he makes us like him, which means he's going to make us different from the rest of the world around us, which we may not always like. But uh, he is purifying creation to fit him, and that goes along with how he is most frequently mentioned in the New Testament as the agent of sanctification. There, there are cases where the Father is sanctifying us and the Son sanctifies us, but you, you add things up. Who is sanctifying us? Who is making us pure and right and conform to Jesus? It is the Spirit, because he is the one who is holy and active in our lives. He's also identified just as power. That doesn't mean every reference to God's power is the Holy Spirit, but most of them are. And so when, when you have reference to Jesus, power was present for him to heal. I think that that's an implicit reference to the presence and action of the Holy Spirit. Uh, he's just called the power of God that you will receive as a gift from on high. And he's going to clothe you with power, that kind of thing. So you have prophets talked about being filled with power. Uh, Mary is told the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Acts 1.8 says you will receive power. And these are all references to receiving the Holy Spirit. He just is the unlimited divine power of God, the effective energy in our lives for anything that God would call us to do. He's also identified just as the gift. I mean, there's not a whole lot to uh, explain about being a gift other than a gift is something you can't earn or deserve or even control. We don't deserve him. We don't deserve his presence or action. He, is, he comes on his own will and uh, he is freely given. We are to freely receive him and we don't deserve his work in us. We can't manipulate him. Uh, I'm not sure what, a teacher and paraclete, it's, I, I have trouble with this, but um, finding exactly one word. Sometimes it's translated, paraclete's translated uh, comforter or counselor or helper. Those are all probably inadequate on their own. We probably need a whole couple of phrases to really do it best. But if you look in context how the, what the paraclete that's to come does, there's a lot of teaching and mentoring kinds of things, particularly showing us how to live the way Jesus did, reminding us of his teaching, powering us to live the same kind of way of life that he did. And that fits with other passages to conform us to the image of his son. He does things uh, that might be confronting us, more like a coaching kind of thing. So it's not teaching just in terms of informational, but it's teaching in terms of driving and supporting and encouraging. And paraclete really comes from the Greek world of somebody, when you're uh, being prosecuted at court, the paraclete is somebody who comes alongside to help you and defend you and support you. So sometimes it's translated advocate, but uh, I'm not sure anybody has really a, a good grip on it from what John really wanted to say and what, whatever, uh, whatever Jesus was saying anyway. So if we put all these things together, I think we could come up with a pretty rich definition just according to these words and the metaphors of who the Holy Spirit is and what he is doing, which I'm not going to do, but um, they, they're, they're bringing up for us a lot of implicit references. and so. 
The, the evidence for the Spirit, if you just look for the number of times in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is mentioned, it comes up pretty small. It's minimal. I mean, compared to the Father and the Son. But if you include all of these others, then I think that the, the definition gets much richer. So he is named in some particular ways in the Bible. And so uh, we want to ask, how is he named? It's not just, you know, literary flourish or um, variety, but the names actually tell something about him in the way that he is named. And so the, uh, the first thing I think that shows up the most is that he is, uh, the word isn't used that he's the agent, but the idea is there. The way that he is named indicates that he is on a mission from the Father and from the Son. So in Genesis 6, 3 and other places, God is speaking. He says, it is my spirit. Now, that can't be the Trinity speaking, because the Holy Spirit is one of the Trinity. So it's got to be either the Father or the Son speaking. He's called the Spirit of God a lot of places. And again, it can't be the Spirit of the Trinity, because he's one of the Trinity. So I think that it's, it probably should be interpreted according to Matthew 10, where Jesus says, the Spirit of your Father. And so those other speakers or speakings of talking about my Spirit and the Spirit of God is probably, we should say, my, meaning God the Father, this is my spirit that I am sending on mission, right? And so that, what that says, the spirit is named with reference to somebody else that is limiting him in some sense or defining him by his relationship to the Father. And the same thing happens in relationship to the Son, where he's called the spirit of Christ, spirit of Jesus, and in a triadic reference, the spirit of his, of the Father's Son. So that is a, a, a kind of limiting thing that is defining to help us understand, oh, he's, he's humble. He, he works on behalf of others, and we're called to work on behalf of others, right? So that's some of it, that he is an agent. He is on a mission, and we'll come back to that a little bit more. He's called the Spirit of Grace. There are, sometimes grace is used in the Bible just to talk about our status with God, that he gives us a gift of favor, unmerited favor that we don't deserve, right? But there are often times where grace is uh, talked about as operative power, God's working, something that works with you, something that powers you. And because we have the Spirit being called the Spirit of grace, we should think of him as powering our lives and uh, as an active force that labors and, and take those as a synonym for the Holy Spirit. He's also called the Spirit of truth. First uh, John even says the Spirit is the truth. So he is uh, truth, I think, is the truth of the gospel, the truth of scripture that he inspires, that he uh, causes us to be able to understand, that makes effective in preaching, evangelism, discipleship, whatever. So um, he is very concerned with working in the world according to the word of God. And that's just his job to promote and convict according to God's revelation. Uh, there's also a phenomena where he is named with the Father and the Son. And so there's a variety of references to all three persons. And I think that this is God apart from creation, uh, as he has always been. This is not just something cooked up for our benefit. So uh, we have these triadic passages where you have all three persons listed, and there's every possible arrangement is given. So the normal one in Matthew 28 is uh, baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? But the fact that you have everything switched around indicates that there's a plurality of God and an equality and a unity among all three because any of the three can be in first position or second position or third. And there's never any most God, second most, third most. There's never you know, the big God, the little God, the medium. There's nothing like that. It's just shifting them around. And when you put them all together, it's, you don't have to wonder, is the Holy Spirit being called Lord and God? Or it, who does Lord refer to? Is that a divine term? It, it's, it's very consistent that Lord is most often always used for Jesus. God always is used for the Father, except for maybe seven times. And uh, God is almost never used for the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, and so passages like this pair Father with God, and that's helpful for us. So every possible combination shows up for us. And there are other passages besides this. And just the, the collective force of it indicates, yeah, the, all three. He's, he, is, he is listed right alongside the Father and the Son. If they're God, then he is God too. And it just, it shows his equality with them. So that's, I think, interesting. And that's also the first line of evidence for his deity. 
that if you have somebody listed alongside two others, like these guys, and let's say one of them, uh, let's say number five is Joe, and you say Joe is a professional football player. And number 53, he is, that's Mike, Mike is a professional football player too. And then 22, you say 20, you know, uh, what, Steve. Uh, Steve is teammates with Joe and Mike. You don't have to identify him as a professional football player. You, if, if the other two are, then, then you conclude that reasonably as well. So we can build up to the deity of the Holy Spirit by his close association uh, in equality with the Father and the Son, and there's more evidence for them. And then we also have statements where he is lined up with uh, being identified with God in a sort of indirect way. In Haggai, God assures them, I will be with you. And in the same statement, he says, my spirit will be in your midst. And I think we're supposed to draw a connection there. So it's kind of like looking at the deity of the spirit in reflection of a mirror. It's, it's not straight on direct. And I think some of the hesitation on God's part to do that is so we don't conclude that there are three gods. So there's a little bit of reserve about the deity of the Son, and there's a lot of reserve in the deity of the Spirit, and he knew he would bring us along to Trinity in our understanding, but in terms of unfolding it to us, it's got a um, little bit of mystery to it. Same thing's happening in Acts 5. They tell Ananias and Sapphira, you've lied to God, you've lied to the Spirit, and then you've got statements in Acts and also a couple times in Hebrews where they quote something from the Old Testament. And they lead in the quote by saying, the Holy Spirit said. But if you go to that passage in the Old Testament, the speaker is clearly God. So it, again, it's an indirect identification of the Holy Spirit with being God, right? And then we have statements where he is just identified with things that are proper only to God. And there are a lot more than just the ones I'm going to bring up, but he is identified with God's omnipresence, where shall I go from your spirit, uh, David is saying. In Luke 1, he has the power of God because he can make a miracle baby, right? He can make a virgin uh, conceive. Uh, he, has, he, know, he alone knows the thoughts of God, right? So he is omniscient. And then in Hebrews 9, he is called the eternal spirit who powers Jesus to, be, uh, to make atonement. Uh, he, Jesus offered himself through the eternal spirit. So... Yeah, that really puts him in the divine category, and then he also does things that only God can do. And this is usually pretty normal stuff that, that you'll see, like in Grudem or whatever, so that's why I'm going fast. Anyway, so yeah, he's, he's involved in creation. Uh, anything God does is always a team effort, and so if God creates, the Holy Spirit creates, and he's specifically listed that way as well. Uh, he reveals scripture. Only God can truly reveal God, so he reveals God through scripture. And... He is, uh, has a particular role in salvation alongside the Father and the Son, and then he, raises, he raised Jesus from the dead, and he also raises us from the dead. It's the same spirit. So this adds up for the church's conclusions with someone, I think that's Nazianzus, uh, at Constantinople 1, where the Arians had turned their arguments that had been foiled against Jesus, now they turn their arguments against the Holy Spirit and trying to, they were called the Spirit Fighters, and they're trying to deny the deity of the Spirit. So they add on to the Council of Nicaea, I believe in the Holy Spirit, that's, that's as far as they got in 325. I think they believed a lot more, but that's all they said. And they add on that he is the Lord, the life giver, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped, and glorified and who spoke to the prophets. So they're using very definite biblical phrases to identify who he is and what he does, and it's, it's clearly in a divine category. So in terms of building a model of the Trinity, you've got uh, the Father, clearly the Father is God and the Son is God and the Spirit's God, and yet they're not the same person. So it's I think much earlier than 381 they, they were articulating this, but um, that's kind of where he got the spotlight in um, council stuff. So another sort of conclusion, uh, the external works of the Trinity are undivided, which I'm not really sure who said that. I've heard Augustine, but I've also heard Nobody can find where he um, actually says it. But anyway, Basil says, every divine action begins from the Father, proceeds through the Son, and is completed 
in the Spirit. So we can think of the team effort kind of idea where the Father, Son, and Spirit, they're just one God, right? But they have different roles. Like in salvation, the Father is arranging things. It's his job to choose and send and what, or whatever. The Son is the one who actually becomes a man and dies, and suffers the punishment of hell. And the Spirit is the one who applies these things to us. So it's, it's a unified program where uh, the Father kind of functions as God for us, you know, this, having this plan of salvation, the Son is God with us, you know, uh, Emmanuel, and the Spirit functions to bring God to bear within us, indwelling us, and the new covenant blessing. So it's, it holds things together. How is he related to the Father and the Son? We've already seen this in the way that he is named in relationship to the Son. He is kind of their agent of the Son and the Father, but he's also... Uh, in some sense, dependent or at least obedient or humble in the way that he functions uh, as sent by the Father and sent by the Son. Because if the Son is just like the Father in every way except for being the Father of the Son, then he does and has everything the Father does. So he sends the Spirit as well. So, uh, what do I want to say? So there's still difference, and I think we can distinguish... Uh, by these arrows are sort of, uh, well, you could say authority or rank or how they function. And the Spirit is kind of sent by both. And he's manifesting humility, submission, response for us. And then the Father and the Son are manifesting authority, leadership, and initiative. The Son's also doing humility. But um, I think that this is a good model for us whenever we find ourselves in positions of having to obey others, we're being like the Holy Spirit. And when we find ourselves in positions of uh, having responsibility, then we are uh, carrying out roles that are also in God. So anyway, his, he's got personal traits that we should clearly never recognize him as an it. The scripture does use a masculine pronoun, he, for the Spirit. And so uh, he is grieved by, spin, by, by sin. Uh, he teaches people uh, in Acts 7, he can be resisted, he loves people, he uh, makes choices about what gifts he's going to give us, and then putting Ephesians and Hebrews together, he can be outraged and insulted. Well, you never say that, you know, a, you know, the force was insulted, you know, the force was offended, that kind of thing, right? So he's clearly a person. And his personal works are involved with creating, sustaining, renewing, uh, giving new birth, right? And all of these are very close in works. They are the spiritual kinds of things, and which makes sense because he is the spirit, right? So he has to do with your spiritual life, your, your being alive, your spiritual vitality, raising from the dead, revealing, sanctifying, and uh, empowering us to do things, empowering the Messiah, empowering us as well. And I think also distinctive of his personality is that he functions as the agent of the Son. Jesus tells us this, that uh, when he goes, which has already happened, he's going to send the Spirit, Pentecost, right, which is really the Father, Son, and the Spirit coming. Uh, Jesus says, the Father and I will make our home in whoever believes in me, right? Uh, but he says the Spirit is going to guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So he's, he's functioning very, I guess, contingently and within limitation. And that's a model for us because we're, we're not to do with just whatever we want to do. We're supposed to function within the limitations of what God calls us to do as well. So his work is very Jesus-focused. Uh, and he's kind of working to show Jesus in us and through us to the world. And uh, so there is a, a pattern of word and spirit working closely together throughout the Bible. Anytime the word of God is shown to be really active and powerful, I think that's implying the spirit. And in terms of models of the Trinity, uh, we've got the kind of family model, and then we've got the sort of working model where the Spirit is always working to uphold the Word, and the Word is re re bringing us back to the Father. So, uh, an interesting parallel is in Colossians 3, where he says, Let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. And then he has these typical results that follow of teaching and singing and uh, thankfulness, 
uh, through Jesus to the Father. He says exactly the same results that follow in Ephesians 5 from surrendering to the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Don't be controlled by a substance. Instead, be controlled. Let be directed by the Spirit. And these things are going to flow out of your life. So some of how we can think of how do I want to have, how do I get more of the Spirit's presence and action uh, in my life, that's going to be exposing ourselves to the Word of God. That's why so much Christian life is centered around preaching and study and memorization and meditation on the Word, because the God, the Spirit, works through the Word. So all of that is the first half true, uh, of the, the person of the Spirit. And now we're going to shift to the works of the Spirit. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.